my name's Fonda Arbetter, and it is May 13th, 2021, and I'm interviewing Manuel Rajanov for the One Story at a Time project. It's called Viva Shalom, Celebrating Latin American Jews in Dallas. Good afternoon, Manuel. Hi, Fonda. How are you? Good, good to talk to you again. Same here. Will you please tell us where you're from originally? Um, well, I, I was born in Mexico City. I have a pretty unique uh, background. Uh, I was born in Mexico City, uh, but uh, when I was uh, eight years old, uh, my family moved from Mexico City to the border, to Tijuana, which is on the border with San Diego. Um, and I, I, I stayed there until I graduated high school. Uh, and and what's, what, what school did you go to in Tijuana? So it's, it's, it's an interesting story. So um, obviously, Tijuana uh, at that time was, was, was somewhat of a small town. And, right. most, and, and all of the private schools were parochial. Um, uh, were either boys only Catholic schools or girls only Catholic schools. Okay. There, there was this one school um, uh, out uh, uh, on, the, on the outskirts of town that was run by a group of uh, Southern Baptists. Okay. Uh, and, they, and they ran it on a secular basis, but they also ran it on the platform that it was the only bilingual school uh, in town. And so that's where all the Jews send their kids. At the time, the Jewish community of Tijuana was probably about, I want to say 900 families, a thousand families. Um, and uh, uh, yeah. where, where did they all come from? Uh, from Tijuana? Um, how did they end up in Tijuana? Well, most of them were originally from Mexico City or one of the large cities in Mexico, right? And and, and, and a lot of them went there just to, uh, just to strike fortune, just like my family did, right? I mean, they wanted to move into a smaller, uh, the border was, it was always very dynamic. There was a lot of cross-border commerce and cross-border tourism. And that gave a lot of these families the opportunity to, um, you know, to, 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 to strike it out in business. And they built a very, very nice community uh, on the Mexican side of the border uh, back in the 60s and 70s. Wow. Eventually, the community eventually the community moved northward and to the U.S. But it's still wow. it's very interesting how, even though the community has been basically U.S. based for probably the last thirty years, uh, maybe thirty five years, um, it's it hasn't integrated to the broader Jewish community of San Diego. The, the Mexican Jewish community of San Diego is still pretty pretty self contained with their own institutions, their own their own. Um, uh, you know their, their own uh, their own organizations, and they stick together. Um, but but my schooling at the time, so we all went to this school run by Southern Baptists, which they 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 were secular. They were not teaching religion. Okay. Uh, but they ran it under a very Christian method, very Christian philosophy. Uh, but they were very very open and, and very welcoming of the Jewish population, and and that's where we the Jews went to school. The, all right. The, the, the okay. byproduct of that is that it was bilingual. That's how I learned how to speak English. Oh, tell me, um, what kind, did you have a Jewish life in Tijuana? I mean, what, what kind of synagogue, what kind of Jewish community center you had? Yeah, I, we had a very vibrant Jewish community, Jewish life in Tijuana. Um, like I said, there was a thousand families and we were very, uh, very, very, co very well stuck together, very cohesive. Uh, we had our we 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 have our own. I mean, they're still still operating the, the JCC, which served both as the social gathering place for the community, but also as a shul. Uh, it was a I would say a conservadox synagogue. Okay. In the sense that uh, on Friday night services we could sit men and women together, uh, but on Shabbat and the high holidays we would sit separate. Um, and, uh, you know, some, I mean, microphones were used, but no video. I mean, it was a very, it was a very, uh, like I said, conservadox community. Uh, but it was very, uh, it was very, very, very strongly committed to Judaism. And we even had, uh, we had, a, we, we had a, a Hebrew school, which operated every day from Monday through Thursday. So. And where, where, where did yeah, you meet? At the JCC. I mean, we would, we would, we would. Uh, 
we would go we would go to a regular schooling you know during the day from say 8 a.m in the morning to two o'clock in the afternoon uh-huh and then we would go from 4 30 to 6 30 monday through thursday for um uh, for hebrew school um and yeah go ahead. And, go then, ahead. and then and then on saturdays we had our uh, our our zionist youth organization uh affiliated with uh with maccabi so oh, no. uh, it was it was a very very zionistic very very uh jewish uh community that was very very attached to our cultural uh, heritage did you graduate um uh, uh high school in tijuana yeah I, I graduated high school so that little baptist school that i went to only went through middle school okay. um so for high school you know we all had to make decisions and and a lot of the people went to it went to the u.s to to high school, to a public school in the United States. Some others um, went to a, a, a different high school in Mexico. But for me, the best fit was actually a Catholic high school. And okay. I, was a, I was the first Jew to ever be uh, admitted into this Catholic high school. Um, and it was very, very interesting because my parents were very, very concerned about me going to this school. So they negotiated with the, with the, with the headmaster of the school that I did not have to attend religion classes. That okay. during, during religion classes or mass, I could go to the library and, and work on a paper on a, I would have to submit a paper each month in Judaism. Uh, so, you know, I probably wrote four papers and recycled them throughout the, 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 the years, but-, but uh, Very but, interesting. But, but and was, and, uh, and you was, graduated there. Yeah, but let me, it was quite interesting that after one year I figured, you know what, this is silly. I'll go take the classes and I'll just use it as, as cultural background. And I did. And, uh, and I learned a lot about, about, about the Catholic faith and, and it actually reaffirmed my Jewish faith. Um, and that was very interesting. So I graduated high school in 1990 and then I moved back to Mexico city. My entire family, we moved back to Mexico city and I went to law school in Mexico city. And um, how and why did you make the decision to leave Mexico? <laughs> This is another interesting story. So when I was uh, when I was in law school in Mexico City, I was clerking for the Mexico City office of a U.S.-based firm in San Antonio, a very small firm in San Antonio. Okay. And um, when I graduated, they told me, "Hey, why don't you come and work in the U.S. for two or three years, and um, you know, learn about how we operate, etc. And eventually, you can go back and help us develop our own Mexico City office or a broader Mexico City office." Um, and at the time, I was I was single. I had just finished law school, and I, I really wanted to come back and be closer to the U.S. So I said, "Why not?" So I moved in January of '96 to San Antonio for what was supposed to be a three-year stint. And 25 and a half years later, I'm still here. Um, and the main reason I ended up staying was because uh, I met Debbie, my wife, um, who is uh, originally from New York but grew up in Chicago. Uh, her parents are Israeli, uh, and you know we met when I was working on a project in Chicago for a client, and uh, and I decided that I wanted to stay in the U.S. and make a life out of uh, living in the U.S. And uh, eventually, I changed jobs, and in '98 uh, we moved to Dallas, and we've been here ever since. Um, what brought you to Dallas? It was a job. It was it was it was a job opportunity. I, I wanted to go to a bigger market. I wanted to go to a bigger firm. Um, I wanted to work on, 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 on bigger uh, matters that I was working on in the small firm in San Antonio. And, uh, and I met through some people that I met. I, was, I had the opportunity to come to Dallas. Um, and all the work that I do still has to, it still uh, deals with Mexico. So I continue to go to Mexico. My entire family is still down there. My siblings, my parents, my aunts and uncles, my grandmother. I'm the only one that doesn't live in Mexico City. Uh, so I, I still go down there, or before COVID, I was going down there a lot, um, and still see family. But I ended up in Dallas because, because of a job, and uh, the community embraced Debbie and I fairly. Debbie and I got married about six months after I moved here, and the community has embraced us since then. And both of our kids were born here, uh, and, uh, and and this is where home is for us now. Uh, can you list your kids and their names? Sure. So uh, I have a daughter who was 19 years old. Uh, her name's Abby, uh, Abigail. Uh, she goes to Ringling College of Arts and Design in Sarasota, Florida. Very nice. 
she's she just finished her sophomore year we're very proud of her she's a very talented art student mm -hmm. and an very artist. familiar with it yes yeah i mean you've seen her work yes uh, and then our son our son is joshua josh is 16 years old and he's a sophomore here at wakeland high school in frisco okay very good now you know we didn't talk about your um grandparents or how your entire how your family ended up in mexico city uh, sure. So, I mean, my, my family is a total mishmash. Uh, oh, well, let, let's sort it out. Let's start with your either great-grandparents or sure. grandparents, start, whichever I'll, one. I'll, I'll start on my father's side. That's going to be okay. Important. So on my father's side is Ashkenazi. Um, on, on my father's side, my grandfather's family uh, came to Mexico in the 1920s from Ukraine. Um, they, the, the entire family came, was, was from around the, the area of Kiev. Um, and, um, and my grandfather was actually born in Kiev. Uh, and his father... Uh, give me his name, please. Uh, David. David. David what? Rajanov. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah. got it. Got it, and, got it. Uh, and, and, and he and his family, you know, his father and his mother and and his siblings, they moved to Mexico in the 1920s. And what uh, brought them to Mexico? Uh, I mean, they were just fleeing. Fleeing, fleeing Cossacks? Yeah, yeah. Fleeing, fleeing prosecution in Europe. Okay. And again, they all wanted to come to America. I mean, the, the family, I mean, the goal of the family was to come to America, but at the time, and America meaning the United States, but, you know, immigration into the United States was limited. So uh, usually the next port of call was either Cuba or Mexico. Uh, and they came to Mexico, you know, with the idea that one day they would come to the U.S. But obviously, uh, that's the story of the Jewish community of Mexico you know, in general, not just my family. Right. Um, and, and they eventually, you know, stayed in Mexico and made a great life. Uh, my grandmother on my father's side, they also yes. came in the 20s. Uh, and they came from Poland. Uh, same reasons, escaping prosecution. Okay. Uh, and, uh, and they, they, again, they, they settled in Mexico. Um, and, um, and uh, you know, and, 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 and that's, and, and, you know, we, we had family that was left back, back in Poland and, 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 and the Ukraine. And, and, and unfortunately, a lot of them perished in the Holocaust. Um, and uh, some of them were able to escape. Uh, some of them are in Israel today. Some of them uh, uh, are in the United States. But, but I really, they're very distant family members at this point. Do you, do, how did your grandparents meet in Mexico City? Uh, I mean, I mean, the, the Mexico City community has always been very tight knit. Okay. Um, they just met through the community. I mean, and, and it, it's, it's very, it's very, um, it's very, um, the community is also very uh, divided amongst uh, ethnic background. And by, by I mean, I mean, geographical background. Yeah. Yeah. So the Ashkenazim have their own institutions, their own synagogues, their own day schools. Uh, you know, their own everything. And and then and then the the Sephardic, they're even further divided amongst themselves, depending on the on, on the areas that they come from. And that's where my mom's family is from. So my mom's family, um, my great grandfather on my mom's side, on my on my grandfather's father, on my mom's yes. came to Mexico in the 1910s from, okay. from uh, Aleppo, Syria, okay? Wow. And, uh, and, and they, they, they were not escaping prosecution. There was no problem. They were just looking for, again, they were coming to America. There's, there's a big, my, my family name on my mom's side, which is Tawil, is a very, very large uh, family uh, from Aleppo, Syria. There's actually Jews and non-Jews. In that. Can you spell that for me? P-A-W-I-L. T-A-W-I-L. Correct. And, and, and if you go to Brooklyn today, you'll find a lot of Syrian Jews that come from Aleppo. And there's a lot of people that have that same last name and they're all somehow related to me. But wow. My great grandfather ended up in Mexico. Uh, and then on my grandmother's side, on my mom's side, uh, her family was originally from Damascus. But at some point in the 1890s, they went, they went to live in Beirut. And my great-grandfather and my great-grandmother met in Beirut. And they eventually came to Mexico in the 1920s. 
um, via Paris. How many, how many kids did they have? They had 12. 12 children. Yeah. And, and so actually, your, your, your my, mother's one of 12. No, my mother, no, my mother's one of five. My great, my grandmother had 11 siblings. Um, Got it. My, the interesting thing is that at my, at my grandmother's house in Mexico city, there is a picture of her. There's a wedding picture of her parents. The truth is, is that that picture, and then they're wearing the wedding dress and the tuxedo. The reality is that that, that picture was not taken on their wedding. That picture was taken when they were in Paris on their way, on their way to Mexico. And by then they already had three children. And my great grandmother was pregnant with a fourth. Wow. Uh, that the, is, yeah. are they, are they any of them living now? My grandmother and so my grandmother and her younger brother are the only ones alive. The only only ones. And they live in Mexico City? They live in Mexico City, yes. Uh, and give me your, uh, wait, the last name of your grandmother, her maiden name? Yeah, it's Yedid, Y-E-D-I-D. -E okay, and she was also from... Uh, she she was she was born in Mexico, but but several but but three of her siblings were born in Lebanon. Okay, got it. Okay, got it. So, um, did your grandparents in Mexico City have any uh, on your mother's side? Did they have a business or what did they do? Uh, so uh, on my on my father's side, um, they were uh, they owned tanneries. They were leather leather people. Uh huh. They own leather tanneries and leather distribution businesses. Okay. On my grandmother's side, on my on my mom's side, I should say, uh, they were all in the schmata business, clothing. Okay. Um, uh, and um, and that's and that's what they did at the time. You know, the, the Mexican Jewish community in Mexico, from I would say, from the early turn of the of the twentieth century till the forties and fifties. They were both all merchants. They were mostly merchants. Sure. Very few of them went into into any into any type of professions or even went to college. Um, at the time, you know, there was a lot of anti-Semitism in Mexico. The um, the community managed to um, organize itself in a way that um, it created every institution you can imagine to protect the Jewish community from assimilation and anti-Semitism. Uh, that's why you have, I mean, you have in Mexico today, you have about 30,000 to 50,000 Jews. That's it. Um, but you have about 10 day schools that go from pre-K to, to, uh, to high school. Um, you, have, you have the largest JC scene in Latin America. Um, I mean, they just have every institution you can imagine for Jews to basically live in a Jewish environment. You know, our guest speaker for the event, May 27th, is the consultant on a new museum being built about the Jews. It's brand new. Yeah. It's being built in Mexico City and she's the consultant. Yeah, that's pretty, that's pretty cool. I mean, the Mexican yeah. community is very unique in the sense that uh, it's, it's very similar to the South African Jewish community from what I gather. Uh-huh. And, um, and uh, in the sense that it's a small one, but, it, but, it, but it's very, it's very influential in Mexico. It's been very, very successful. The anti-Semitism that I talked about was never any overt anti-Semitism. Was more like we, they wouldn't allow kids to join. You know, they wouldn't allow Jewish families to join clubs or to go to certain private schools, whatever. Um, but it's been a thriving Jewish community. It's been both financially very successful, but it's also been uh, very enriching to the arts, uh, to literature, to journalism. Uh, I mean, Mexico, everybody, you know, the Mexican Dan Rather, right? The Mexican Walter Cronkite, okay. uh, the man that for 40 years came into Mexico's living rooms to deliver the news from the 1960s through the 1990s as wow. a Jewish man. And, oh, uh, no kidding. Yeah, yeah, Jacobo Sabludovsky. Um, and uh, and uh, so, so the... The, the Jewish community, even though has never pursued political power, uh, you, we have Jews that have been, you know, ministers of government, or but we've never had any any member of the Jewish community run for public office for elected office or whatever. 
the Mexican Jewish community has always been very, very uh, respected by the community, has been very respected by the government. And, 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 and it's been, it was really very, it's been always very well embraced by Mexican society. Um, do you get together with a lot of your family members around the country uh, once a year or, or do you have any traditions like that? I mean, when, when we go to Mexico, I mean, we, I mean, I mean, I go, I mean, I go to Mexico probably, I mean, again, before COVID, I would go to Mexico twice a month. And uh -huh. in, invariably I would go to dinner with my family. I mean, I would go to dinner. Sure. With, I mean, um, I mean, we, 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 we tend, my family comes here, we go there. Uh, where there's a big simcha, we go down there and we get together. Uh, we don't have a tradition of a family reunion once a year, but but we tend to try to see each other as often as we can, as the as the as you know as the opportunity arises. You know, I I know that you have been very involved in APAC. Tell us about uh, your involvement in that organization. Well, you know. Growing up in Mexico in the Jewish community, uh, Zionism was 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 part of who we were. Right. Uh, being being supportive of the state of Israel and being uh, uh, a Zionist was part of our essence. And um, you know, when 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 I was growing up, I always saw Israel as a, as a, as, a, as an important component of my life. And you know, a few years ago, but that once I was fifteen years ago, after the Second Lebanon War, I was starting during the Second Intifada. I was struggling to figure out exactly how can I uh, support the state of Israel while in the United States. And uh, Rabbi Weinberg Aranche and a few other friends uh, introduced me to APAC. And I've always been very passionate about politics and I've always been very passionate about Israel. So APAC gave me the, gave me the ability to combine both passions and be able to channel uh, my appreciation for politics and my love for Israel in a way that would, that would make tangible difference for, for Israel. Uh, APAC is, is a bipartisan lobbying organization. And, and what we do is we, we, we work with our elected officials, the 535 members of Congress, to make sure that the United States stands shoulder to shoulder with Israel, because Israel is not only a critical ally to the United States, it's a beacon of democracy and progressive and, and American values in the region. Uh, and, and, and just a small example of the work that we do is being on display this week. As rockets are firing on Israel from Hamas terrorists, um, you know, Israel, the Israeli society is being protected by the Iron Dome missile defense system. Uh, make no mistake about it. The Iron Dome missile defense system is Israeli technology, but it would have never come to be had it not been for the strong support of the United States and specifically the financial support of the United States government. And APAC plays a critical role in that by lobbying our members of Congress to make sure that they appropriate on an annual basis uh, military assistance to Israel, much of which, uh, some of which goes to developing these missile defense systems that right now are not only saving Jewish lives because obviously uh, they're intercepting rockets that are being uh, uh, lobbed at, at, at Israeli civilians, but they're also saving Palestinian lives. Because if it were not for Iron Dome uh, and, and Hamas would be firing rockets at Israeli civilians in the rate that they're firing them, Israel would have no other choice but to immediately go into Gaza and neutralize the threat from the ground, which would inevitably um, result in much, much higher Palestinian casualties. Sure. So Iron Dome is saving Israeli lives because it's, it's intercepting the rockets that are being fired at Israel but it's also saving Palestinian lives because it's allowing Israel to restrain itself from taking even more uh, aggressive action to neutralize the threat. Well, APAC's really lucky to have you. Uh, um, are there any other organizations that you're active in? Yeah, I mean, I'm very involved with our synagogue with Anshay Torah. Um, I'm, 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 I'm very involved with, with, with what, what we do at the shul. I think that the shul is the central um, gathering place for our community. That's where my kids, uh, grew up. That's where they went to preschool. That's when they went to Hebrew school. That's where they were bar mitzvah, bar and bat mitzvah. That's where I hope they get married one day. So the synagogue is is a central element of our Jewish life. Uh, I'm involved with AJC. I like I like the, some of the things that they do, um, uh, and and uh, 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 you know and, and other organizations for Israel America, uh, Jewish Rock Radio. Um, you tell know, me, any, tell me about that. What is so that? 
So Joey's Rock Radio is the brainchild of, of a good friend of mine named Rick Rick. Um, Rick, I'm sorry, Rick who? Rick Rick. Rick oh, Rick. He's a, he's a child singer. Correct. He's a, he's a Jewish musician that, right. that, that mostly does songs for children, although he does songs for teenagers. He's, he's a very popular figure in the, in the Jewish camp circuit. And about uh, 15 years ago, 10, 10, 15 years ago, he started this organization called Jewish Rock Radio, um, which essentially is an incubator for Jewish artists. And, um, and it's actually a website that you can go on Jewish Rock, JR, JewishRockRadio.com. I think that's the website. And you can listen to this artist play their music. Um, and there's a channel that's dedicated to Israeli music. And, uh, and that's uh, Debbie and I um, are, are, are the sponsors of that. And uh, so I'm involved. I mean, I'm on their board. I'm the board of Pro Israel America, which is a political action committee supporting. Wait, wait. Tell me, tell me that clearly yeah. again. Yeah, so I'm on the board of directors of Pro Israel America, which is a, a, a political action committee, uh, which uh, which is which essentially uh, what we're doing through that is we're the largest bipartisan pro Israel political action committee in the country. We raise money for uh, Democrats and Republican pro Israel candidates, uh, and we raise it from the general public. You're gonna uh, have you're gonna have to tell me. I'm sorry again. The the it's, it's pro Tell me the name America. again slowly. It's pro Israel America. Pro Israel America. Correct. And that's different than APAC does the elected officials. Correct. A APAC is a lobby organization. Pro Israel America is a fundraising fee. It's a political like fee. like CLF or something like that. Uh, more like Act Blue or Winred. Okay. Okay. Okay, so it's pro Israel America, Correct. and you're active in that. Correct. Okay, do you want to show um, some of the sure. pictures of your family? Sure. So uh, I don't know if you guys can see this. Uh, 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 get it pretty close to take, your, let me your take, camera. Let me, take, let me take out the virtual background because that's what's causing the problem here. Just give me a second. Can you see? No. So this is a picture. Can you guys see it? Um, yeah, lean it down just a teeny bit. No. Oh, yeah. okay, right there. So that's a picture of my family in Acapulco when Abby was months old. This is my grandmother, my mom's mother. That's my mom. That's my dad. This is my brother who's 30 years old now. That's my brother-in-law. That's my sister and my nephew that's 19 years old now. That's Debbie, my wife, and Abby, my daughter, and that's myself. I'm sorry, you're gonna have to go back and tell me their names. So that's Debbie, my wife. That's me. Below it is Vicky, my sister. And next is she married? Yeah, she's married to the guy next to her. This is Ariel. What's his last name? I mean, Picker. her husband's what? Picker, P-I-C-K-E-R. -C -C okay. All right, and she's holding her son, Alan. Okay. Next to them is my brother, David. Okay. Next to David is my father, Furman. Okay. Next to my dad is my mom, Anna. And next to my mom is my mom's mother, my grandmother, Victoria. Yeah, you told me her last name, Victoria. Yeah. I will. Uh, yeah. I will. And Got this it. is this is a picture of my grandmother, Victoria, holding Josh, my son. Uh, where's the picture taken? In Acapulco, also. This was a few years later, of course. Very nice. Yeah. So, so um, I, the rest of the picture I have are electronic. Um, in this day and age, we we don't have them printed, so I have a bunch you of electronic. Know, you you can send them to Jessica, and she can add them into your file. She oh, can't put them in the video, but she can put them in your file for you, just so if anyone ever researches you later on, they can see the pictures. Oh, that'd be great. I'll do that. But make sure you list the names yeah. of who they are because and where your the pictures are taken. <laughs> I, will, I, will do so. I will do so. And is um, Debbie active in school? Tell me. Just real yeah, quick, so, what, so, what she does? 
So Debbie is on the board of Anshe, uh, and she's about to be on the executive committee of Anshe. Uh, very, very involved. She's chaired many committees at the shul. Uh, she's chaired, um, uh, you know, she's chaired the childhood committee. She's chaired the religious school committee. Uh, she's uh, chaired, uh, she's chairing a fundraiser right now, the Menorah Project, uh, uh, and now she's going to be in the executive committee. So uh, again, leadership in the Jewish community is important to our family, um, uh, not only to Debbie and I, but to our kids. Abby's been involved uh, in, in Jewish causes uh, her entire life. And now Josh, uh, Josh is involved with AJC's Leaders for Tomorrow program. Uh, he's involved in the Stand With Us internship program, high school internship program. He's been on APAC Saban high school uh, training uh, 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 summits, and he's on BYO leadership, the regional board. Uh, so, you know, being part of a community, Jewish community is, 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 I mean, we are first and foremost Jewish. You know, with my background, right, I'm from Mexico, living in the United States. My grandparents are Ukrainian, Polish, Lebanese, Syrian. Uh, and, 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 and my wife is born in New York from Israeli parents that came to Israel, came to pre-state pre pre Palestine from Germany. Um, what are we? The reality is that we're Jewish and that's the essence of who we are. Uh, and, and, and that's it. We're very proud of it. We're very, uh, we're, 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 we don't shy away from it. We're, you can see I have an Israeli flag behind me. Um, and, and. Being Jewish is the essence of who we are. So being leaders in the Jewish community is important to us. Well, uh, is there anything else you want to add to this? I think we've touched on it all, except, except just real quick. Um, did you send your kids here to a Jewish preschool? No. Uh, yes, the preschool, yes. They both went to Anshe for preschool, but then they went to the public school systems here in Frisco. Okay, I just, I just wanted to clarify that. Yeah. Now, you, um, I think we've touched on everything. So uh, any uh, closing words? No, thank you very much. I mean, this is a great project. I wanna thank uh, the, the Jewish Historical Society for doing this. Uh, it's very exciting uh, for me. It's an honor to uh, speak to you guys and to share my, my story. Uh, and I can't wait to see the final product on the program. You know, Dallas is very lucky to have you, your wife, and your children here, so involved in the Jewish community. Um, I just want to thank you. No, thank very you. Thank you, and, and give my regards to Jay and uh, and regards to your daughters, and uh, great I talking will. to you. I will. Thanks, Manuel. Thank you. Okay, talk thank to you, you later. Bye-bye.